Welcome back to segment three. Segment three on grace and works. The balance of that, the truth of both, not taking one and becoming extreme with it and going into error as often people want to do and do do today on both sides of the fence, right? And uh, so we have seen in scripture how there's a wonderful balance in scripture. Uh, Grace and works both mentioned 118 times in the New Testament, you know, a perfect balance. Uh, And we talked about how the age we live is so easy to become complacent and apathetic. Uh, So many people down through the years have given so much to bring the church to where it is today. And we've got our part to play today. We can't sit on our laurels and say, well, you know, we, we just live in the blessing of God. And we do live in the blessing of God, and I praise God for that. And God does want to bless us because he loves us. Hallelujah. Uh, But likewise, we've got to understand that when we do go through some problems or some trials or some tribulation or some trouble, uh, Jesus uh, talked about the parable of the the, uh, seed sowing on the ground. You know, when the worries of the world come up and choke, hey, I want to produce fruit. I want to produce 30, uh, 60. I want to produce 100 fold, right? And so what I was closing last segment off, segment two, uh, I was talking about how, you know, that uh, if you just uh, think that God loves you so much, you can go and do anything and he still loves you. And there's an element of truth that he still loves you. But God hates sin and God doesn't want us to sin. Why? Because if you sin, you self-destruct. Sin produces death. And sin will always take you further than where you want to go. And so people who sin, as you know, I mean, let's be honest, it was only one drink that led to a drunkard's lifestyle. It was only one act of immorality that led to a prostitute's life or whatever. And uh, as I said, there are scriptures today that, that, that I know can be hard and can seem intolerant, can seem judgmental. I'm not being judgmental. We're all sinners. I, I, you know, I was a chief of sinners and I needed saving by the grace of God and so forth. But when we have not a love for the truth, God gives us over to a deluding spirit. So I've got to preach the whole gospel. I've got to preach this, the hard verses that, that I can't sometimes understand either. And I, and I don't, some verses I don't want to read, you know, the, talking about the sufferings of Christ and how the Apostle Paul says, you know, if we reign with him, we'll also suffer with him. Or if we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. I should get it the right way around, right? So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. For this reason, and you can do your own study, God will send them a strong delusion, for they should not believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So when we have pleasure in unrighteousness, we're not believing the truth, the full balance of scripture. And uh, God uh, (laughs) send a a, a strong delusion. Uh, Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity to serve the flesh, but through love, serve one another. Do something through love, serve one another. But don't use your liberty, the liberty, the freedom we have in Christ as an opportunity for the flesh to sin. Don't use that. Don't say, I can go and do all these things because God will still love me tomorrow. I understand, friend, that we're saved by grace through faith in Him. I went over that in segment two. If you didn't hear it loud and clear, I apologize. I couldn't say it any more clearer. And uh, faith is simply believing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. We talked a little bit about repentance, about turning from sin. Repentance means going in a in 180 degree, not 360, not back towards sin, but, but turning away from sin, 180 to 180 and walk away from sin. You know, you've transferred out of the domain of darkness and, and, and put in the kingdom of light. And so, you know, we've got to understand that we are now living a different life, not a life that we would please ourselves, no, but a life that would please Him. And so faith is believing, repentance is turning, and, uh, you know, it's important uh, that we repent and believe and have faith. Amen. So the good news is to every man and every woman is given a measure of faith. Some people say, oh, I wish I had your faith. You've been given a measure of faith, right? You've been given a measure of faith. Faith grows. It's a little bit like exercise. Exercising in the gym, muscles grow. Hello. And so you've got to grow your faith as well. It's the size of a mustard seed, but it will grow. Grace, we understood, is unmerited favor. We didn't deserve it. We were sinners. We were doomed to die. Jesus died for us. Grace is unmerited favor. It's also the empowerment to live the Christian life. Amen. Let's read Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy 
because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It is not as ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Now, if I just ended there, not of works that any man should boast. See, when people think of works today, we're thinking about helping people, doing good to people. That's not what the scriptures are talking about. It goes on, listen now, verse 10. Not of works, lest each and one should boast. Verse 9, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so there are good works that we... Uh, need to do and should be doing. So we're saved by grace, not of ourselves, as a gift of God. And, and uh, you know, uh, the question is, of course, once we're saved, well, verse 10 tells us, verse 10 tells us that now we're saved to live a life of good works. And so I could ask, well, what are we saved for? Obviously, we've talked how in times past, how salvation is improvement of life. Praise God. Our life improves when we get saved. Our health improves. Our marriage is improved. Our finances improves. Praise God. Does that mean to say that Christians don't go anything? Don't go through things? Of course not. We go through things, right? But salvation is overall life improvement. Yes, it's also about going to heaven when you die. That's the place you want to go to. Hell, you don't want to go there. Salvation is about eternal life, but it's also about relationship, about relationship. The Westminster Shorter Catechism that was uh, put in by the church in 1646, it says, the chief aim of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I like that, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, the chief aim of man. And so it's a relationship. It's a relationship of one of the father and the son, the creator and the created, the teacher and the student. He is my father. I am his son. He is the creator. I am the created. He is the teacher. I am the student. It's one of relationship. And one, of course, that wouldn't be as popular today when you think about that. And yet you cannot read the Bible and, uh, and ignore it. And that is the master and the servant. He is the master, I am the servant. Now, again, because of our culture, because of the day in which we live, servant is not a good thing, right? Servants, you know, we kind of think we look down on them. They're second-rate people. Uh, they're like slaves. And so we don't like the word servant. And yet you cannot read the scriptures and ignore that word. The parables of Jesus talking about us and even, even the great commendation, the proclamation that we all want to hear, I'm sure, when we get to heaven, well done, thy good and faithful servant, right? Not well done, thy good and faithful son or thy good and faithful student, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. And that doesn't go down too well, talking about servants today. But I'm, I, I just want to say I'm more than happy to be a servant of God. I'm, I, I want to be a servant. I am a servant of God. I know I'm a son, praise the Lord. I'm a joint heir with Christ. I'm going to inherit all things, praise God. Um, you read the book and you know that Paul and Peter and James and John, they all primarily referred to themselves as a servant of Christ. Even James, who wrote the book of James, he was the half-brother, the step-brother of Christ. He did not begin his book by saying, James the stepbrother, the half-brother of Christ. No, James the servant. I mean, Peter writes it. John writes it. Paul. I mean, John, the disciple who Jesus loved, the one who, you know, the Last Supper says he's so close to Jesus, he's leaning on him. You know, he still writes his servant. And they use that description of themselves way more than any other and way more than claiming some privileged position. It was a 95% of a humble position, a humble position. You know, down through the centuries, we've had our church fathers, incredible, amazing people. One, ones who I would say a little bit like the scripture says, the world is not worthy of. And I know that they probably live lives that some of us, because of the aestheticness of it, they would afflict themselves with fasting, with prayer. I mean, you know, we may not agree with their lifestyle, 
but I honor them. And they were doing what they, they believed and they were walking in the light that they were given. And the world declares, uh, you know, the Bible says they lived in caves. They were sawn in two. Um, you know, I mean, these people and the world was not worthy of them. They worked incredibly hard. I think about Tyndale, trans, uh, you know, writing the scripture, um, um, translating the scripture. Uh, I think about their dying breath, the last dying breath, you know, the, the last verse. And I, I just think about the amazing people down through the years, the one who recanted on Christ and wrote a recantation under pressure, under, under torture. And then he puts his, then he, he goes back on his recantation and, and, and says, no, I believe in Christ. They're going to take him out to be burned at the stake. And he puts his hand over the candle and, and burns his hand and says, let the hand who denied Christ be burnt first and foremost. I mean, th these people were incredible. I don't know what you think about them. Um, I know that, you know, they lived in different days and some of the things may seem strange to you, but they were amazing people. And um, they lived incredible lives, very, as I said, sacrificial lives and uh, very self-denial lives, but they have brought the church to where it is today. And I am grateful for their lives that they have given so much. And I praise God for the truth we have today. I mentioned it early, having the revelation that Jesus came to bring us life and life more abundantly. I praise God that God does delight in the prosperity of his servants, that it's not all about martyrdom. It's not all about self-sacrifice. It's not all about that, but it's not all about this either. You know, the devil, Jesus said, he's the one who comes to rob, kill and destroy. And, uh, you know, when he can't hold back any longer, he'll take the truth and he'll swing it into um, error because it just becomes an error and, and the pendulum needs to swing back. Uh, he did it with faith. When you think about it, at one point of time, it's hard to imagine, but the church um, uh, kind of like went from no faith to extreme faith. Um, you know, when you think about the hymns in days gone by, um, weak and weary pilgrim, beaten back by Satan's power. I mean, that was the way Christians saw themselves. Um, today, you know, we're more than conquerors, we're overcomers, right? Um, and so, you know, when, when, when the truth came about faith, you know, speaking and believing and confessing, not blabbing and grabbing, because a lot of people, you know, said, well, I spoke it, but didn't come to pass. I'm not talking about blabbing and grabbing uh, because, you know, that's an error either. You've got to have the word of God. You've got to speak the word of God, the stand on the promise of God. You've got to, an arema from God even. But the thing is, is that the church went from no faith to extreme faith. The church went from poverty to luxury to and prosperity. We saw the truth in prosperity. But as I said, next thing, you know, you're kind of like you're in sin or a second rate Christian. If you haven't got a private airplane, I know that can sound extreme, but there are people who, who think we all should be billionaires. Well, you know, prosperity is enough to have to meet your need and to help and have something to give away to help somebody else. And, and so the devil pushes a pendulum in the opposite direction as far as he can go. And so then the truth becomes error again. And he's done that with grace. Now, please read my lips, please. We need grace. We need grace. 100% we need grace. It's a biblical word. I thank God for it. Amen. But we also need to live lives of righteousness. We need to, as Ephesians says, to take off and to put on, to take off and to put on. I mean, I think about prayer. I think about fasting. I know some Christians who say, well, we don't need to fast. Jesus fasted for us. Well, Jesus said in his word, when you fast, when you pray. And so we need to be people of prayer. Prayer is hard work at times. I don't, sometimes I don't feel like praying, you know, coming to the prayer meeting, you know, but pray we must. Amen. And fast. Who likes fasting? And yet I know in days gone by in their aesthetic lives, when they were living lives of self-sacrifice, they fasted all the time. They, I'm literally, you know, they lived lives of fasting. Um, but I know Christians today who don't fast at all. They're both extremes. We do need to fast, not all the time, uh, but, we, uh, but we need to fast at some times, right? And so even of good works. Now works, we'll talk about it, but works in the New Testament includes praying for the sick. That's a good work. Now we need to pray for the sick. We're commanded to pray for the sick, right? Works in the New Testament includes helping the poor, the unfortunate. Works in the New Testament is seeing miracles. Works in the New Testament is serving in the church. It's not the works of circumcision and of the law uh, of the Pharisees. And you can read all about the laws of Leviticus and all that kind of stuff. I know we can talk about them in typology, but Paul talked about 
those works when he said, that's not what we're saved by. We're not saved by those, those religious works, but we do need to be involved in good works. Colossians 1 verse 10 says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Have you read that even when it came to putting widows on the support list in the early church, a qualification, <laughs> listed qualifications, I know this doesn't sound very good, but this is New Testament. We can't think, well, we should help everybody. And obviously we, we can and do something for people. But here's 1 Timothy 5.10. Put a widow on the list. If, if it's well reported, 1 Timothy 5.10, for good works, that if she brought up children, if she's lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, this is the work, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. And so twice it mentions a good work that a widow needed to do to receive support from the church. So our forefathers, history is filled with men and women of old, who I believe like the men and women who fought in World War I and World War II, such sacrifice, such dedication, such commitment, such endurance, least we forget what they did, hallelujah, way beyond what you and I probably could imagine. And many of those war hero heroes today, I think would be dismayed at the state of our nations, the state of the apathy and complacency and sin and the so-called liberty today, because they fought for our freedom, but not for what we see <laughs> rampant through the nation today, you know, the rebelliousness and so forth. But likewise, I, I think that many of the saints of old would be appalled to, at today's apathy in the, in the church, the worldliness in the church, particularly the Western church, hiding behind grace, hiding behind God's love. And because, uh, you know, people say, well, it's not about works, you know. Well, salvation is not because once we're saved, hallelujah, then we are saved unto good works. So we're not saved by works. I understand that. The works of the flesh, the works of religion, rules and regulations. But once we're saved, praise God, we're not saved to serve ourselves. We're not saved to build our little Babylonian captivity lifestyle. We are called to further the kingdom of God. I hope and pray that you are hearing me on that. In our next segment, we'll be talking about a couple of the people who of old, who I honor and I admire, and I know you do too, and I thank God for their lives and what they did, the price they paid. You know, Jesus paid the ultimate price, we know, but the saints of old have paid a, a great price to bring the church to where it is today, and I do thank God for them. And so we'll talk about a couple of them, and I hope and praying that you're enjoying this. And, and as I said, I know some people probably tuned out at the beginning because they think, no, I don't want to hear about it. Uh, God loves me. Uh, God accepts me. Uh, the gra the, God's grace is upon me. I, I, can, I don't have to do anything and all that. And so some people just want to go down that path. And, uh, and as I said, unfortunately, they will go into error if they continue down that path. We've got to understand the balance of Scripture. We've got to understand that there are things we are called to do, like pray and fast and uh, be involved in serving in the church and be involved in helping other people in the good works of Christ. Amen. And so I hope and pray that you'll stick with me in the next segment, segment four of this uh, topic, a very topical today. Uh, you know, there are things that are very controversial today. We know that. We could talk about people's lifestyles. We could talk about people's choices today. Uh, very controversial. But as for me and my household, we'll believe this book. This book is not outdated. This book is not ir irrelevant just because society has changed yesterday, today, and forever. All may change, but Jesus never. Amen. So his word is still good today as it was then. There's scriptures that I'm not going to uh, rip out just because I can't, I don't even maybe personally, I won't say uh, agree with. I know some, there are some things I find hard to understand. I agree with this book because I've just come to learn, hey, I can trust in him with all my heart and I don't lean on my own understanding. I know there are some scriptures in here that some people would not agree with and they would want to contend with God and argue with God about it, but I'm a little bit beyond that. Uh, God is God. He's on the throne. I'm his servant. I am his son as well. But I will just go with his word. Amen. And I'll go with all his word. Praise God. And so I just hope and pray that you stick with me in segment four as we continue on in the subject. So thank you so much for listening to the Legacy Project today.